Hello dear children. Today we are going to start a new chapter that is chapter 2 Lost Spring. Lost Spring is an excerpt from Stories of Stolen Childhood which was published in 2005. It focuses on children from deprived backgrounds. Here Lost Spring means lost childhood. The children who are deprived of enjoying their childhood. So let's start the chapter about the author. First let, let me tell you something about the author. The author of this chapter Lost Spring is Annis Jung. She was born in Raul Kela in 1944 and spent her childhood and adolescence in Hyderabad. She is an Indian woman author journalist and columnist for major newspapers in India and abroad. Her most noted work that is Unveiling India which was published in 1987 which is a detailed chronicle of the lives of women in India. Let us have a look at the background of the chapter. Annie's Jung analyzes the grinding poverty and traditions which condemn these children to a life of exploitation. The introduction of the chapter. This chapter depicts the deplorable condition of poor children. Children must enjoy their days of the spring and joy, that is their childhood days. But there are children who are deprived of all this due to their socio-economic conditions. This chapter is divided into two parts. The first part describes the plight of the poor rag pickers of Simapuri in Delhi. The second part describes the miserable conditions of the bangle makers of Ferozabad. Now, let me tell you about the characters. The two protagonists of the chapters, part one, Sahebi Alam. He is a rag picker. He has simple dreams. He believes in promises made to him. In part 2, Mukesh, he belongs to a family of Bengal makers. He dreams of breaking away the traditions and becoming a motor mechanic. The narrator is Annie's Jen. She is a social worker who empathizes with the slum dwellers and honestly portrays their pitiable lives. So dear students, I would be telling you a short summary of part 1. Sometimes I find a rupee in the garbage. Here I is Sahebe Alam. This is the author's encounter with a boy named Sahebe Alam when the author first meets this boy who visits the nearby garbage dump every morning looking for valuables in the garbage. Seeing the boy searching something in the garbage, the author asks him, Why do you do this? The boy tells her that he had left his home in Dhaka, that is Bangladesh, long ago in 1971 and did not have many memories of it. His mother had told him that their homes and fields were destroyed and swept away by the storms. And so they all moved to the big city looking for gold. Now, what does this gold over here mean? For them, anything for survival. And they look for useful items in the garbage which can be sold for cash. After this, the author asks Sahib why he does not go to school. Sahib replies that there is no school in his neighborhood. The author, jokingly, in a lighter sense, promises to open a school. She made him a false promise. After few days, the boy comes and asks the author, is the school ready? 
the author feels really very ashamed. Nevertheless, she realized that such promises are made to these children almost every day. They have many unfulfilled dreams. Then the author asks him his name. When the author comes to know that the boy's name is sahib alam which means Lord of the Universe, she notices the irony in his name. She feels it is that it is not suitable for him and it would be hard for him to believe. Unaware of the meaning of his name, he would go around with a group of boys all barefoot, some wearing a different shoes in both feet. The author curiously asks them why they don't wear slippers. One of them replied that his mother doesn't bring them down from the shelf. There were some children who wore torn shoes. Some desperately wished that they would find a pair in the garbage heaps. Another boy said he wants to wear, but he doesn't have any pair of shoes to wear. One boy claims it a tradition to remain barefoot. The author is left wondering whether it is actually so, or it is an excuse to hide the never-ending poverty which has gripped them. The author is reminded of a story of a man from UDP who, as a young boy, would pass a temple where his father was a priest and on his way to the school, he would stop at the temple and pray for a pair of shoes. The author remembers when she visits the temple after 30 years. Behind the temple, there was a house of a new priest. She noticed the young boy of a priest was wearing school uniform, socks and shoes. So she realizes the standard of living of some people has raised. It has improved over the period of time. The boy goes to the temple and prayed that he should never lose his shoes. Garbage is gold for the poor people of Simapuri. The author with the rag pickers goes to Simapuri. It was mere wilderness. It has no basic amenities in the area like sewage and no water facility. As many as 10,000 rag pickers have been living there for more than 30 years. They are all Bangladeshi refugees who migrated here back in 1971 without their identity or permits. Yet, they have valid ration cards which fetch them grains and the right to vote. For their mothers, feeding the family with enough food is more important than getting an identity proof. They are satisfied if their children sleep peacefully without aching or empty stomachs. They prefer to live here rather than in the fields at home which give them no grain. Survival in Simapuri means rag picking. For the children, the garbage is a rabbed wonder where they find precious things like a rupee or sometimes even 10 rupee note. Annie's Jung realizes that garbage holds a different meaning to both parents as well as the children. For parents, it is the source of their livelihood. One winter morning, the author found Sahib Alam standing outside a tennis court watching two men play. He tells her that he loves this game. He also tells her that sometimes the gatekeeper allows him in and then he takes the swings over there. The author notices Sahib was wearing tennis shoes. One foot was torn and it had a hole in it. Probably he found them in the garbage as a rich child must have discarded. It is like a dream come true for Sahib wearing a shoes. Another morning, the author sees 
Sahib on his way to the milk booth carrying a steel canister. Canister means a can. He informs the author that now he works at the tea stall and is paid rupees 800 and all his meals. When the author asks Sahib that is he happy? Sahib Ayalab tries to hide something from the author. But the author feels that Sahib is not happy. His face has lost his carefree look as he is no longer his own master. He has gone into someone else's hand. Thank you so much children. I hope you have understood the summary of part 1. I have tried to include all the major points which are required in part 1. So after this we would be discussing about part 2.